Thanks, Victor. I'm glad to introduce Franz because he's been my old friend and collaborator. Uh, in fact, uh, I would like to point out he started his American career as a visiting scholar at Northwestern, I think 1997. He has uh, been a professor now for many years of civil engineering at MIT. Uh, he is also uh, the faculty director of the Concrete Sustainability Hub, uh, 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 which is uh, a large center, actually uh, also another center on the urban side. And uh, what is unique about it, that it is funded by semi concrete industry, which normally does not fund large projects. It's not like mechanical engineering. But you see many, many, many millions actually for his spectacular research at MIT. Uh, he uh, has his uh, engineering degree from Munich and degree in mechanic, rationnel from France, kept for his PhD and also Dutton habilitation. Uh, he has done a major work in uh, concrete chemomechanics, poromechanics, and nanoscale modeling of creep and fracture. He founded and directed two large centers I already mentioned in this field, particularly, uh, funded from PCA. He also made major contributions to the mechanics of gas shell. In my view, a very, very important subject to change the world. He is uh, famous for uncovering new properties of hydrogen cement with statistics of nano indentation and for the developing of the scratch test. Uh, recently, his main focus was on bridging engine mechanic and statistical physics, which, uh, what, which is a subject we will discuss today, ranging from molecular scale to mesoscale fracture mechanics, and actually apply extending it also to urban scale problems. He has received several major awards, the uh, total for Carl Medal, for Carl Medal is considered the top in mechanics from ASCE, uh, Vermeer Medal from Rillem, Hugo Prize, and so forth. He was elected as fellow of the ASC Engineering Mechanic Institute and the European Academy of Sciences and Arts. Uh, with this, I would like to ask uh, Franz to give us his lecture. Please. Thank you very much, Stenig, and thank you very much uh, for all of you to zoom in, um, zoom into fracture mechanics. Um, uh, I uh, want to thank all colleagues who met with me today. I learned a lot from uh, wave scattering uh, to uh, uh, electrostriction today and uh, uh, seeing at work uh, the talent um, at Northwestern University, a place I always uh, cherish. Um, now, today I want to take a, a, a fresh look on fracture mechanics. Um, and uh, we'll talk about fracture mechanics in the semi grand canonical ensemble. I will write quite a bit on the screen so that we keep this a little bit alive, uh, uh, this whole uh, discussion. So the talk which I'm going to present here is uh, of course the work of uh, typically one student and uh, the one I'm talking here about is the, the work of my student Talal Muller who is about to finish his PhD. It was done in collaboration with my uh, colleagues uh, Roland Palanc and Katerina Ioannidou from CNRS uh, when they were still at MIT and uh, uh, Sina Moini uh, who uh, recently in January uh, graduated uh, with a PhD. Um, not to make you uh, uh, afraid, I want to start with a few preliminaries which are important for the rest of, the t of, of this talk. So my first point here I want to make, I will, I speak about a Griffith type fracture mechanics approach. And what does that entail? Well, it means, first of all, that um, we're talking about an equilibrium-based approach. Griffith is all about fracture mechanics between two equilibrium states, which means we have uh, a potential energy. Uh, e pot is uh, the Helmholtz free energy F minus the work by external forces. Of course, here I will work in displacement-driven approach, so I will kick out this last term here out 
uh, of uh, uh, the equation. I will talk uh, uh, about energy release rate and you know the energy release rate is the derivative of uh, the potential energy with regard to a crack surface gamma and the critical energy release rate is GF, the fracture energy. Uh, we're dealing with an irreversible process which means that the fracture surface can only increase and uh, finally the dissipation here is uh, uh, the product of the driving force, the energy release rate G multiplied by the crack surface created. So there's nothing new here and we'll stick within that framework. On the, on the other hand, what I will talk about, I will put this here in some thermodynamic ensembles. And for those who have uh, never heard about thermodynamic ensembles like me, maybe uh, 10 years ago, uh, let me just tell you what they are. Uh, so let me start out with the most classical one because it is so close to what we do as engineers. And particularly, it's the so-called NVT uh, 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 ensemble, so-called canonical ensemble, where NVNT stands for, well, prescribed quantities, namely um, N, the number of particles, which is basically a constant mass if we prescribe them. V stands for the volume. Uh, we prescribe a volume or volume change, so it's a more more generally, you would like to look at that as a displacement driven test. And isothermal conditions, T, we impose a given temperature. The engineering mechanics equivalent, therefore, you know, for those who come from the mechanics side, is basically, you know, sort of an isothermal displacement driven, displacement driven situation. So please keep this uh, in mind. Um, when I speak about NVT. The energy we are talking about, well, is uh, well just uh, right here, the potential energy for uh, these conditions is basically here the, for the Helmholtz energy minus the work by prescribed forces. And again, this term is zero here. And uh, uh, we minimize this potential energy. It is, uh, uh, in our case, it's a function here of uh, N, V and T. So these are basically the boundary conditions of our problem. So the equivalent of ensembles can be viewed as a well-defined boundary uh, 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 value problem. The state equation, the corresponding state equations here is, uh, are, well, the pressure P, uh, the pressure P, which is the derivative of the Helmholtz energy with regard to the volume, right? Uh, the entropy S, which is the derivative of the free energy with regard to temperature. And then something what mechanicians are less uh, uh, common to talk about is the chemical potential mu, which is uh, the derivative of this energy in this ensemble with regard to the number of particles. So just take this thermodynamic ensemble as a way of defining, well-defining uh, the boundary conditions of a system. Now, NVT is sort of the classical ensemble which engineers love using, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the grand canonical ensemble. And what I mean by the can grand canonical ensemble is that instead of controlling the mass uh, N, uh, the number of particles N, I will control the chemical potential by means of an outside bar. I come back to that here to, to, to uh, give you a better idea uh, uh, in a little while. But just if you think about this here, the equivalent in uh, uh, mechanics uh, actually is an open system and an open system, the closest one, which is, uh, comes to this new VT ensemble is the open system in poro mechanics. So when you have a liquid, for instance, entering uh, 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 the pore space, then each mass of liquid brings with it some energy. The energy, please note, is still the potential energy, but this potential energy now here will be equal to, well, the Helmholtz energy, and then here the open system mu times n, mu being the chemical potential, and n 
uh, uh, the, the number of particles. And this needs to be minimized in the same way as we do this in all applications, so to be minimized. Often in, in statistical physics, it's called the grand potential uh, um, of the system. Now, the associated state equations, so the formalism is much the same, and I know you're well-trained in, in Northwestern in the formalism of using uh, thermodynamics is N, then the number of particles with regard to mu, P, the pressure, still with regard to V. So if you want a generalized way of describing, uh, uh, it would be to use stresses and S, uh, the entropy uh, uh, of uh, the system. Now, so that, that's, I just want you to keep that in mind. I will use this grand canonical ensemble in a semi-grand canonical way in just a two, a two minutes. But my third preliminary is about interactions potentials because they will play a role. And let me consider here the simplest example here of uh, a system, two mass points, I and J, I and J connected with, you know, a spring. That's basically what a potential is with a certain distance R an initial distance, and uh, uh, then U describes, the energy U describes the, um, uh, the, the, the interaction energy between the two mass points I and J. So how does this energy look like? And that's a slight difference to what you may be used to. So if I have a, a, a linear elastic behavior, then you basically have an energy which is quadratic, we call this harmonic potential, right? And it has a minimum. And this quantity will play quite a big role in uh, what I'm going to talk today about. Well, this minimum energy is this energy well here, is the ground state energy minus epsilon zero. And it's negative, epsilon zero is positive, but minus epsilon zero is basically ground state energy. Now, such a, uh, the potential then here, if we uh, uh, write this here, would be U is equal minus epsilon zero. And then you have here plus one half times uh, lambda square, lambda is the stretch out of the equilibrium position, R zero. <clears throat> and then here, uh, a potential describing the elasticity, epsilon I square, we call this here a harmonic potential. But then there are more complicated potential, for instance, a Morse potential or Leonard Jones potential. And the way how they look is basically that they turn here, <clears throat> have a, a, a change here, and then approach uh, the zero as you go to a uh, large uh, 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 deflection. So in this case, the uh, potential here would still read as U would be, uh, so the ground set energy minus epsilon zero, plus here, and now very important, uh, this stretching here, this quantity, which basically is this difference here, U lambda and U lambda between I and J, which just has the energy, which typically we use as mechanisms when we describe the free energy of a system. So depending on this function, you have different function, uh, 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 potentials. You can have a Leonard Jones potential, Leonard Jones, or you can have a Morse potential. I will uh, have examples today of a Morse potential. But the key message which I want you to carry with you here is the following, that the total energy is always a ground state energy, U naught, plus this energy associated with strain energy, U lambda, right? So you have here the ground state, which defines the equilibrium position, and it has a non-zero value. It basically holds the material together. And the other one is associated with the strain energy. Finally, the last thing, and maybe the, the, the real interesting method which I'm going to use here <clears throat> will be about uh, uh, some derivatives. And consider that X and Y are two random variables then if you remind yourself from your statistics classes, dx over dy, and you know, we're using all the time derivatives, is equal to the covariance of 
x and y divided by the variance of y. Just keep this in mind because I'm going to use this here. Of course, I need you know, enough values of x and y in order to make this evaluation, but this will be turn out a key to our understanding of uh, the method which we are using here uh, for fracture mechanics. So with these preliminaries in mind, let me specify what I'm going to talk about. So you have all read my thought experience, so I will restart with this here and make this thought experiment with you alive. Experiment, you will hear that I'm German origin Gedanken experiment, right? I will carry this thought experiment into how do we develop stress-strain relationships, stress-strain relationships. So something which you're well familiar either from a lab or um, from your simulations or from your classes. Then I want to take this stress-strain relationships into uh, a phase diagram. And that is uh, some, and phase diagram, I really mean this in the same sense like uh, a phase diagram of water, which defines in a pressure temperature uh, um, uh, uh, domain, uh, uh, the, the, the critical point of water or the boundary between uh, solid and liquid and gas. So, but I will do this phase diagram for brittle fracture, for brittle fracture. So hold your breath here. And then I will show the application to uh, uh, heterogeneous materials, how we can use this framework in order to address this question. Well, how do you homogenize actually um, uh, the fracture resistance of heterogeneous materials before I come to some conclusions? Okay, let's start with a thought experiment. So, Here's the thought experiment. And I make it very simple as Stanek taught me, you know, to, to talk about this. So we have a simulation box and the simulation box here is basically is, is this one here. I apply here a volume change, as you see here, because I'm in an ensemble which defines the volume. Epsilon V is the volume strain, right? Uh, of course, I keep the temperature constant and I, later on I will specify how you can do that here. And then you, you do one additional thing. You put from the outside, and here from the outside, uh, a radiation source, like a radiation source, mu, uh, uh, here uh, a potential, right, which targets each bond in the system, each bond. So it's, re it's really an outside radiation source which targets each bond, right? And you ask yourself, well, which bond will go first given that I have a certain strain? Okay, so this is the semi-grand canonical uh, ensemble. It's not grand canonical because I'm not targeting the mass. The mass is always constant, but I target the bonds. So that's why it's semi-grand canonical, but I still have this mu value, this outside radiation source, in order to probe all possible bonds to rupture. And how to describe this actually? Well, the, the way how to describe this as you, can imagine is by means of probability. What is the probability that one, which bond will go first? And the probability here, Pn, from, to go from a state of n bonds to n minus one is defined by an exponent. Then we have some, some uh, uh, Boltzmann factor, Kbt, uh, I mean, under isothermal conditions, it changes here. And then here comes the two critical quantities which are there. One is the delta mu here, which is with negative sign, the uh, prescribed outside radiation source. And now for us mechanicians, much more interesting here, is the change of the energy in the springs as I remove one spring, so from n to n minus one. So, so note this bit, please, very clearly. This here is the change of the spring energy, right? Of of the energy energy due to a deletion of bond. 
Okay, so, but that's only half of the picture. Because if you can delete one, well, you also need to ask yourself, what happens if I add one to it? So I have already some vacancy in the system, so I've already taken it out. Well, will it, if I apply now this radiation source, uh, will it now uh, um, insert another bond here? So again, what I need to do here is to address the probability, the probability here of the, uh, of the system here, probability here going from N system with N bonds to N plus one bonds, right? Again, here you have exponent here of the Boltzmann factor, KBT. Uh, and then here now, the big uh, parenthesis here, you have the plus delta mu, uh, uh, and then here minus delta u, the energy of the springs, including the ground state energy, to n plus one. So please note and bear with me that uh, this here is this same change in energy, energy due to the addition of a spring. Of spring, okay? So that's basically the whole semi-grand canonical thought experiment. It's not more to it unless there's one thing. So what you basically do is you prescribe a delta mu, so this radiation source, you prescribe a volume change, which we mechanicians know very well, and the temperature, and then you delete or remove or add uh, uh, bonds as long until you reach equilibrium. And at equilibrium, that's the key point here, the probability of insertion, meaning P for N to N plus one, is equal to the probability of deletion, so N to N minus one. So let's just note this here, this is the probability, probability of insertion. And that is the probability of deletion. Now, for those who have ever worked with Monte Carlo techniques know exactly that this is the problem, the beautiful problem, which you can deal with a Monte Carlo technique here. Uh, so please know this is uh, Monte Carlo technique. And, uh, but please just bear in mind that uh, this equilibrium uh, is nothing else but Griffith's equilibrium based situation. So this is still equilibrium here, equilibrium based fracture mechanics. Okay, so now you ask yourself, how do we actually run these simulations? Well, it's basically you, you choose, you, you basically break down all your moves into three parts, one third deletion, one third insertion, and one third you run MD simulations to allow the redistribution of energy because when you have a strained system and you take out a bond, the energy is redistributed. So you randomly make this move here and by doing so, you create a Markov chain and all this is uh, well coded in the LAMS code. So I leave it there, the rest is, is, is technique here. But what I want you to carry on is here basically is we probe all possible bonds in a system in order to find out which one are energetically equivalent, uh, uh, meaning at equilibrium, the probability of insertion is equal to the uh, probability of deletion. Now, to show you, let's say, how this actually works uh, uh, here, let me show you this video. Can everybody see the video? So what this video basically shows you is on the right-hand side, the broken bonds here, as you strain a system. And, each one is basically, each uh, strain level has a lot of different parts of it. And you see under this homogeneous loading, it's a hydrostatic, actually a hydrotension experiment with the uh, uh, same strains applied in all directions. You see, let's say that uh, uh, at each step, there's no history of it because we're only looking at equilibrium. You see that just the density of cracks increases or bond breakage increases until you form these crack patterns 
in uh, uh, the system, uh, um, the color coding here actually refers here uh, to the energy. So just if, I, if you allow me to play it again. <clears throat> so you basically just keep on probing from the outside for a given delta mu, you probe all bonds, and then you find out the equilibrium when the probability of deletion or insertion uh, becomes the same. Now, once you have these results, of course, you can calculate stresses and strain level. So what this figure here shows you is the stress strain relations and, uh, and others, which are as output. Please note here, that's the mean stress here. So here is the mean stress here and here the prescribed volume strain here. And please note, this is for different values here of a prescribed chemical potential. Please note, mechanician typically work with a zero potential, right? So that comes closest to the last value to the green curve here. On the left-hand side, you see a harmonic. This is a harmonic potential. Uh, so please note this here. Uh, the, this is harmonic here for the harmonic case. So basically linear elasticity. On the right hand side, you have it for Morse potential. Morse potential. So you can generate, if need be here, uh, these uh, uh, um, uh, stress strain relationships. But then there is uh, uh, another quantity which is shown at the bottom here, which is actually a bond isotherm. That's for those of you who worked on, on problem of, um, of uh, uh, adsorption, um, uh, chloride diffusion, you all know about this here. But basically here the idea is delta mu is the prescribed chemical potential. And uh, uh, on the uh, uh, y-axis, you have the uh, number of bonds, of remaining bonds, n over n0. And please note these are averages because each level of uh, calculation has not only a mean value, it also has all the fluctuations uh, such that you can say that the probability of deletion is equal to the probability of insertion. So that's almost, I would consider, sort of the classical uh, um, uh, uh, way of uh, looking at that here. So we have the stress strain level. But what is to be noted is the following. We observe whether it is the harmonic case, so linear elastic fracture mechanics, or the most potential, so nonlinear elastic fracture mechanics, we observe here as expected at uh, uh, some level of uh, uh, strain, we observe here these drops, right? So as we observe these level uh, uh, of strains, we can ask ourselves, well, what can we do with them here? At the same time, we observe similar uh, uh, with each variable associated, we observe actually the, uh, uh, the uh, changes also in uh, uh, N uh, at a given chemical potential. And that's the idea of putting all this into a phase diagram. And that's basically the idea of it. So we sweep in S and numerically the volume strain, delta mu, so the radiation source space here. And then for each set, we determine the critical value at which sigma m, so the stress, drops. And that's basically how the phase diagram looks like. So you have uh, on the one side the solid here, so the uncracked system, and on the other side you have the fractured system. Now, please bear with me, as you go from to lower and lower potentials, you will attack with this radiation source. So many bonds that there's no more any cohesion which holds the material together or a spring which pulls them back. Then it becomes a gas at the lower level. So that's the third space which is here. And please note here again, we have it here for the harmonic and for the Morse uh, plane. Please note for the for engineers, typically when they do fracture mechanics, they are basically here the zero uh, 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 chemical or uh, radiation potential. And you see that there comes here a critical value here for Morse of the critical strain here, uh, which is different here for um, uh, the Morse potential or the harmonic potential here. They are quite different. So a really important point here uh, to be noted, uh, noted here is 
that epsilon v is basically an order parameter. So it becomes an, an order parameter uh, in order to uh, define the system. Now, if you dive a little bit deeper in the state equation, you can actually show that fracture is a first order phase transition. What does that mean? It basically means that it has a jump in the first derivative, which you immediately understand from this curve here. The first stress is a derivative of an energy. You see the jump here, so it's a first order derivative, but you have to look at all the different variables in order to identify this here. So finally, uh, for those of you who come from the uh, uh, physical chemistry side, uh, or physics side, a fracture is, can be shown to be a first order uh, uh, phase transition. So with this phase diagram, and you say, oh, wow, do we really need this? Hey, in the end of the day, we only want to have one point, right? You know, this one here, where do we go with this here? So it's legitimate to raise the question, how does this all relate to fracture resistance? Okay, so, so now, I need to dive a little bit deeper here. And what do I mean by this here? So let's think about this from classical fracture mechanics point of view. So classical fracture mechanics, you have basically the energy release rate, right? The energy release rate here, the derivative of the potential energy with regard to the fracture surface, uh, uh, it must be smaller than the critical value, which is the fracture energy. Now, let's make the analogy for the potential of mean fielded approach by noting that U, the energy, what I showed initially in my preliminaries, is the ground state energy plus, the, let's say, strain energy, U lambda, due to stretching. Now, let's do exactly the same thing what we are talking about here uh, in case of, uh, uh, in case of uh, uh, Griffith. We are writing here, well, the total variation here or the, the not total variation, the derivative of this energy U with regard to N. So now it's a sum of two terms. So you have here minus the variation of U zero with regard to N. And then here minus the variation of the strain energy with regard to N. Now, just bear this with me. Now, just look at this here. What, what does that here re resemble? That's the ground state energy. Remind yourself, this is uh, the value at equilibrium. So that's here, proportional here to GF. Whereas the energy release here, the energy release here is the second term because in the potential energy, we never take into account the ground state energy. So that is G. Okay, but what is actually this du over dn? Well, in fact, for those of you who have ever worked on adsorption problems, know when you put um, uh, an, uh, an atom adsorbs on a surface, it releases heat or not. It's basically, you ask yourself, how much does the energy of a system changes as I add this atom to the surface? Well, in our case, actually this du over dn is nothing else but the heat of bond rupture, right? So let's take this here. That's the heat of bond rupture here. So I marked myself here to slow down a little bit because I don't want to lose you here because now it comes really interesting. So basically this heat here, this heat of, the, of bond rupture is the derivative of, our, of this U energy, which I have for each equilibrium state and N, the number of bonds that which exist uh, uh, in the system. And now, because I have this Monte Carlo approach, because I have this statistical physics approach, configurational mechanics, I created a lot of, lot of microstates, each one being defined by an energy U and a number of bonds. So I can statistically evaluate this heat of bond rupture. Now, Let's be clear about it. What does that basically mean? So here, that's basically here the energy. So the heat of bond rupture here, if you have it, I will write this here in the, the form that we, we can make the difference and the link with uh, uh, classical fracture mechanics. So the heat of bond rupture here. So QBR is equal, so this uh, minus 
the variation of u with regard to n, ensemble average, right? But this is also here minus QBR zero. So the heat released due to ground state energy. And then here minus the heat associated with strain lambda. So let's note this very clearly that uh, 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 this guy here is the heat, the heat release, release uh, due to ground state energy due to ground state energy, basically meaning if I take out a bond, well, the ground state energy will be going off into heat form, ground state energy, state energy. Whereas uh, the other one is the heat associated with the strain energy release, right? Or redistribution associated with strain energy. And why does that matter? Well, bear with me. Now, let's, let's, let's look at these two terms. So we have these two terms, the ground state energy on the one side. So on the one side here, on the other side, the bond, uh, 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 the, the, the bond strain energy release. Now, think about this here, equivalent uh, from uh, fracture mechanics. Well, as long as the heat of the ground state energy, which you release is greater then what is required actually from the bond strain energy. So as long as this quantity is greater zero, the process is stable. Now, if, if it is smaller zero, well, then you are in a difficult situation, You're actually approaching the gas, which, what, what does it mean? It basically means that the ground state energy, which you release has no equivalent anymore in the, in, in the strain energy of the springs of holding the material together. Well, in between the two is the most critical one, which is, is when it's equal zero, it's basically the critical state. The critical state, yeah. And what does that uh, imply? Well, at this critical state here, we basically have the following, a full uh, a Griffith type uh, 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 criterion that the energy d d u lambda over d n when this is equal to minus the u zero over d n. So let's be clear about this is ground state energy, ground state energy, energy. And uh, the other side here is the strain energy release, right? The strain energy, energy. Then this is nothing else but Griffith. Basically, you know, the energy release rate and the fracture energy on the right-hand side, the critical state. Now, the only thing what we do now is we don't take the derivatives, but we evaluate this here from the configurational average in terms of the covariance of u lambda n over the variance of n and then is equal to minus the covariance of u zero over n over the variance of n. And you may ask yourself, why is that here negative? Please remind yourself that u zero for homogeneous material is basically just n, the number of bonds times epsilon zero with a negative sign because epsilon zero is negative, right? Uh, from the plot, you remember here, this here, this energy U, here's R, you see that's the epsilon zero. So it has a negative value which where the sign comes into here. Okay, so how does that actually look like if we look in, into a uh, simulation for homogeneous material? So what I show you here is on the one side here, this, the heat, uh, uh, of bond rupture, and on the bottom, the delta mu, so the radiation source. Now, just bear with me what we're looking here for. We're looking here on the one side here for uh, uh, the, this Q lambda here, which is the covariance of this energy, of the strain energy N with regard to the variance of N. And on the other hand, we look uh, in red here, 
Uh, is that correct? Yep. Uh, is this the red one? Uh, now we look at this line here. Uh, this we have for homogeneous material. That's uh, the uh, uh, Q0, uh, 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 which is the derivative here, uh, the covariance of U0 N with negative sign over the variance of N. And this is here simply minus epsilon zero, which we have taken here as a value N because of homogeneous material. So where's the critical point? Well, you immediately said, let's say when the two are equal, well, meaning basically here, the, the, when the two are equal, we basically identify this point here as the critical point where the, uh, we, we have the, uh, uh, the, the crossing where the Q lambda is equal to the QBR uh, uh, close to a multiplying sign. So then it's the homogeneous material. Jo just in, in summary, what, I, what is here, because it's absolutely critical to, uh, we're on the same wavelength here uh, for the heterogeneous material. Um, in summary, this is nothing else. So keep this in mind. This is nothing else but Griffith, right? Just at the scale of, uh, in a discrete form in terms of bonds. This is nothing but Griffith, right? Griffith, equilibrium based, etc. With one subtle difference, which is that we consider the configurations, these microstates of fracture, as I showed you from simulations. So, which means nothing else, but that we're having here the bond energy release rate, energy release rate, release rate, is equal well, to the fracture energy, fracture energy, and evaluate this here uh, in the form of the covariance the base derivative of uh, 23. Okay, so, so here's basically uh, 23. So, I wanted just to show you that you can describe this by the radial distribution function, but these are just details here. I wanted to show you actually the application to, uh, to heterogeneous materials. And what I'm using here is the heat of bond rupture. You know, the problem of homogenization or fracture properties is that linear average or quadratic averages don't apply to these quantities. However, now that I have a definition of the heat of bond rupture, which is based upon um, uh, energy definitions, meaning with this covariance of the ground state energy and the variance, I can apply this directly to heterogeneous materials. And what I want to do here is basically here to, to show you how that works for a textured material. So a layered material, the other layer, the other way around, I have two materials. One is a ground state energy, epsilon zero A, the red one, which is smaller than the blue one, epsilon zero B. And uh, the question I want to address is, um, what's the composite value of uh, this critical bond energy release rate? Now, to do this here, you just, I want to show you what this actually, this mean, this bond rupture, uh, this here, uh, this uh, uh, ground state energy uh, 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 release rate, fracture energy. It basically means that the number of broken bonds of A, phase A, over the overall bonds here, number of broken bonds here, have released the energy epsilon zero A, their base energy. And please have the base energy here. Remind yourself that this base energy here is in essence is this value here, right? This, this epsilon zero A, so this ground state energy. And then plus for two phase material epsilon zero B. So, uh, and now we can really address the problem by means of simulation determining NBR A and NBR B. But we can even go one step further. In fact, if you remind yourself that I'm using here the covariance here, this expression here, covariance U zero N, variance N. And remind myself that the two are basically just a linear combination for two-phase material of bond A and bond B. And N is the total number of bonds of phase A and phase B. You can simply apply the covariance of linear combinations there too and determine the whole system directly from the number of bonds A and number of bonds B 
but actually from their variants. Now, these are all accessible by simulations, but I can do a few things analytically. So for instance, let's take an upper bound, which let's say is typically here, this, uh, the, the system, the classical layered system here. Please note that I have a volume fraction beta, which is the volume fraction of the blue phase. Now, for such an ordered fracture here, one can show actually by means of conditional probability that this Q0 is simply the linear combination mixture rule of one minus beta epsilon zero A plus beta epsilon zero B, which means the fracture energy is just the weighted average proportional to the volume fraction mixture rule of, the, uh, 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 of these energy. This is the highest from probability theory, you can show that this is the highest possible fracture energy you can obtain given uh, 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 the likelihood uh, uh, of fracture occurring in phase A or phase B. Similarly, we can develop a lower bound by simply looking at uh, that fracture only occurs in the phase A, you all know that, right? It will not go in phase in, this, in the tougher phase. So clearly the Q0 will be the epsilon zero A and you can show this actually analytically uh, directly that this Q0 actually lower bound is just the weakest phase. So these are the two bounds here. But the key question, what happens in between? And there we need some simulations. So I have here the checkerboard. And please note the checkerboard here is, uh, um, uh, you know, for is as zero five, that's what I display here. But here we have phase B, so the blue phase, is in smaller squares. So you must imagine that that would be something of the form, you know, has small little squares here, right, of blue as I increase the volume fraction. And there are two phenomena which are of interest here. By the way, independent, whether it's harmonic or most potential, so linear or nonlinear fracture mechanics, um, you see that there is here a percolation threshold, which you would expect, right? If a fracture were to occur such a system, well, it would activate phase B, this tougher phase. Well, once you have, a, have here a connected thing, actually, this is nothing else but the uh, uh, almost classical percolation theory applied to such a system. But please note it is well up, below here, this uh, uh, upper bound, and of course, uh, above the, the lower bound. Now, this is not only uh, 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 for uh, the checkerboard, uh, you can actually ask yourself, and that's a student problem here typically, what would you do? Would you make it tougher, stiffer? You have all these degrees of freedom. Well, here's the same plot here, which I just showed you here, in function of the volume fraction of the either tougher phase, so blue phase is either tougher, which is this guy here, either or stiffer, tougher and stiffer, tougher and stiffer, or uh, tougher and softer, right? So which one would you think, let's say, would make the cut, what is the, the, the best material to obtain the maximum toughness? Well, it turns out to be the blue one here. And why? It's tougher and softer. So it's tougher and softer than the red face because it approaches the upper bound. So a little bit, you know, like the classical way how we deal with bounds and mechanics, you know, the best economic solution or solution ought to obtain the highest stiffness is not by going tougher and stiffer actually tougher and stiffer is this yellow curve, you see, just reinforces here the, 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 the percolation threshold. It is actually the tougher and softer material. By the way, a problem which is well known from uh, shale gas, okay? Now, what about random geometry? A similar type of conclusion, random geometry, I mean, I have two faces and I randomly, uh, uh, randomly here, attribute uh, uh, to phase A or phase B uh, um, uh, in the system here. You have a similar type of, uh, uh, of situation. The tougher and stiffer one turns out here actually uh, is very similar to the softer material. But all what I wanted to show you here in essence is um, uh, how you can apply this uh, for homogenization, this semi-grand canonical fracture mechanics approach for, uh, 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 for homogenization of uh, uh, fracture properties uh, with the same rigor as we deal with uh, uh, bounds in elasticity, uh, uh, diffusion and other linear type problems. This brings me to my uh, conclusions. I think the first one here is, and I come to Northwestern to present this, it was the school of uh, Bilicko 
configurational mechanics. I think we have exhausted in mechanics everything which goes in time, increment of displacement, etc. The configurational mechanics has so much power in there because uh, uh, we can actually generate configurations and then replace derivatives which we use for minimization problems, for fracture, for many nonlinear problems, we can replace them actually by this, by creating microstates. That's the statistical physics approach which I bring into that field. The semi-canonical Monte Carlo simulation I showed you here are discrete. But I believe that in Northwestern youth and among the many bright students there, uh, uh, one can extend this to the continuum without difficulty. Finally, the key for me is when I evaluate this by the covariance over the variance. I know this is not the normal uh, footprint of uh, engineers, but it is straightforward actually. These fluctuations carry all the information about fracture resistance. In fact, they even would carry all the information for a minimum potential energy. Finally, the application to heterogeneous material here, which I showed you, it's rational. It's really based about uh, uh, the heat of bond rupture. So it's about all about the dissipation which you release here. So I think there's an approach now in place which allows us to address what is beyond a particular case, uh, the uh, homogenization of fracture properties. I only showed you for the isotropic geometry. Tougher and softer takes uh, is the best one here. And gas shale is exactly uh, the material which uh, I think about, uh, about it because you have the carogen in there, which is softer, but you know, it deforms a lot and it makes this whole thing extremely tough. And then we need to have fun with it. And I hope I was not too annoying despite the, the, uh, the, the glitch in um, uh, the testing. I thank you for your attention and uh, 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 for hosting me today. Thank you.